These are the 4.1 notes for pre-calc. Our new chapter is all about polynomial functions. So our essential question, what do I know about polynomial functions? Uh, polynomial function, um, this is an example of one up here at the top where your a's are just your numbers, your n's are your exponents. So the technical definition, a function where n, which is your exponent, is a non-negative, so zero or higher, integer, and an integer is a whole number. So it's a non-negative whole number. Okay, so the degree of the polynomial is the largest power of x that appears. So if you had x squared, the, po the degree would be 2. Examples 1, 2, and 3 are polynomials. They come in two different forms. Example 1 and 2 are what we call standard form. It's like somebody came out and multiplied everything out, so there's nothing that you could do to this problem. Example 1 has a degree 4. 4 is the largest exponent. And example 2 is a degree 1 polynomial. Example 3 is what we call factored form. Meaning if you needed to, you could multiply all these out. It would involve a lot of foiling, a lot of multiplying, but you could do it. When it's in factored form, we have to count up all the individual little exponents in order to get a grand total. So here you have two. Here there's one x right there. And here technically there's three of these. So we're going to have three x's. Add those up for a total of degree six. The next three examples are things that are not polynomials. So we'll talk quickly about why each one is not a polynomial. This first one here, when you have an x in the denominator, it's not a polynomial. No x is in denominator. Essentially, that's like having x to the negative 1 power. And we have to have non-negative exponents. Right here, you have a fraction. No fractions. No fraction exponents. And this last one, no square roots. Square roots are like having x to the 1 half power. So that's another fraction exponent, and no fraction exponents are allowed. All right, next we move into the real zeros. The real zeros are similar to our solutions. It's whatever numbers you can plug in that would give you an answer of 0. So a lot of these are pretty simple to tell. Right here, what would I plug in right there in order to get this little portion? to be 0. Well, that'd be a negative 2. Over here, I've got positive 3. If you needed to, you could always set it equal to 0 and solve. Most of the time you won't need to. You'll be able to just tell by looking at it. Now the other thing is something called their multiplicity. So the multiplicity, that question down here, it's just really the size of each individual x. So the degree would be for the entire function, and the multiplicity is just for each individual piece. Example 7, it's a negative 2 for my real 0, and this has a multiplicity of 1. There's just 1x there, it's x to the first power. Same thing with this 3, multiplicity of 1. All right, on example number 8, here this 2 is not going to get us anything because there's no x. So no x means no real zero. Pretty much just says we don't get an answer from that part. Here, I've got negative 7, multiplicity of 1. Here, negative 5, multiplicity of 1. And positive 1 with a multiplicity of 2. Notice that 2 right there, meaning there are two of these.
Example number nine, out front here I have an X. That's always gonna give me an answer of zero. Remember, if you plugged it back in, you wanna make sure that that gets you a zero, and the only way that's gonna get you a zero is if, if the answer is actually zero. So I have zero, multiplicity of one, negative four, multiplicity of one, positive two, multiplicity of three. The last one, example 10. Here again, anytime you have an X in front, it's automatically gonna give you an answer of zero. Even if you solved it all the way out, you would start by dividing by negative one, that would still get you zero. Then you would square root both sides, still gets you zero. Anytime you have an X in the front, it's automatically gonna get you a zero. Multiplicity of two. All right, now we have a couple things that are squared. The squared ones you always want to make sure you write out. So for x squared plus nine, subtract nine from both sides, and we square root it. We learned last chapter that you cannot square root a negative, so no real zeros. And I especially like the word real here because real means not imaginary. And if you remember back to algebra two, you can actually take the square root of negatives if you start using imaginary numbers. We'll get to that a little bit later. All right, for the next part, this x squared plus minus nine, it's gonna look similar, but the end will be a little different. Add nine and square root. When I square root this one, I can actually get a plus and minus three. I like to write that as two separate numbers. So I'll write that as a three with a multiplicity one and a negative three with a multiplicity of one. All right, the very last one here on the end, x minus 10. That one's pretty easy to do in your head. It's just the opposite sign. So positive 10 with a multiplicity of three. So I've got my answers all spread out here. I've got one there, one there, nothing from the blue, and my three, two answers there at the end. All right, we're actually gonna eventually graph these, so I wanna give you a little bit more information about what a real zero is. A real zero is also the x-intercepts of the graph. All right, that's gonna come into handy tomorrow. In the meantime, let's go ahead and move on to the back side. So next we're gonna talk about how to write a polynomial. We're gonna write this in factored form. It's easier and shorter. If you wanted to put it in standard form, you would just need to start multiplying everything out, start foiling, distributing, all that. We're not gonna worry about that. We're just gonna leave it in factored form, meaning parentheses, all right? So a lot of little pieces like that. Example 11, write a polynomial function of degree three. The degree three is just gonna make sure that we have three things at the end, or at least three X's represented. All right, here's my real zeros. I've got negative seven, negative five, and positive two. Remember when we were pulling those numbers out of the equation, we were changing the sign. So when we put them back in, we're gonna have to do the opposite, change the sign back. So x plus seven, change the sign, x plus five, change the sign, x minus two, and just double check, all has a multiplicity of one, that just means my exponents on each are one, and a degree of three, meaning I have a total of one, two, three x's represented. For example, 12, you have a degree of five and your real zeros are negative one, two, three, and four. Take a minute and see if you can write that. should have x plus one, 
Multiplicity of 1 means I don't need an exponent. 1 is understood. x minus 2, multiplicity of 1. x, change the sign again, minus 3, multiplicity of 1. And x minus 4. But this one has a multiplicity of 2, so we need to make sure we put the 2 on the outside. The next part has to do with the end behavior, meaning what's happening at the ends of the graph. So we learned a little bit last chapter about even and odd functions. So even degrees are when you have a two or a four or a six or an eight. All these look very similar. Let's take x squared for instance. An even degree in x squared is gonna look like this. It's gonna look like a parabola. If you throw a negative in front, all it does is flip that parabola upside down. All even degrees follow that behavior at the ends of the graph, meaning where the arrows are. So maybe, and don't write this, but maybe your graph starts off looking like this, and then it does some weird stuff in here, but ends looking like that. If you didn't see this bottom part where it's got these two kind of funky humps, it would look like a parabola. The ends here and here are the same. So that's what we mean by the end behavior. Tomorrow we'll figure out how to do all these little kind of funky curves and stuff. So if it's got an odd degree, that means it's going to look like this little kind of S-curve shape. And if it's a negative, it would just flip and go the opposite direction. So for each of these, we're going to investigate whether it's even or odd. And then we're going to decide whether it's positive or negative. So that represent positive, that represent negative, positive, obviously, and negative. Let's look at example 13. This is x to the seventh, which means it's a degree seven. And it's a positive. So the very first number, very first sign we see is a positive. So a degree seven is odd, and it's a positive, meaning it's gonna look like this right here. So I'm just gonna sketch out a little graph like that. Let's look at the next one. This is again in standard form, which means it's already been multiplied out. I don't have to add up the exponents. I just look for the largest, degree 10. Notice the negative in front negative. 10 is even, so I'm here, even, and it's a negative, so it's going to look like that. This is a degree 6. Again, look for your largest exponent. It's a positive. You go based just on the number in front. So even, positive, looks like that. I'm gonna do 17 with you and then let you try 16 and 18. So 17 is in factored form, so you have to add the exponents. I have three, four, five, and then six, seven from the two. So three, one, one, and two. That would make a degree seven. The negative is the very first sign that I see. We call that our leading coefficient sign. And so I have a degree odd, negative, which would look like that. Take a moment and try 16 and 18. See if you can find the degree, whether it's positive or negative, and then do a quick sketch.
All right, double check to make sure you got them correct. 16 is a degree three. Again, you just look for the largest exponent, negative. And 18 was in factored form, so you have to make sure that you add those exponents together. All right, we've got one last thing to add to this. Remember, our real zeros are our x-intercepts. So on the x-intercept, a couple things can happen. Let's say this is your x-intercept right here. Let's say you have a couple of real zeros. These points will represent your real zeros. I want to just make sure we're clear about the difference between touching the axis and crossing the axis. So let's say I'm supposed to touch the axis here, then cross then cross, then touch, then cross. I'm going to start at the bottom. And this is just an example. I'm not getting this from example 19 or 20. I'm just kind of showing you the difference between touching and crossing. When you touch, it's like you go up to the door. It's locked, and you have to back away. So you end up on the same side that you started on. Then you try the next real zero. If you're supposed to cross, you would go from one side to the other. Notice how I crossed through instead of just touched. On the next part, you're going to cross through again. Go to the next real zero, touch it, back away, and cross all the way through. So you would kind of get some funky looking sea monster graph like that. So how can you tell whether they're supposed to cross or touch? Well, it depends on the multiplicity. I'll just call it mult for short. But here's the full word in case you need to see it. If the multiplicity is even, it's going to touch. If the multiplicity is odd, it's going to cross. So examples 19 and 20, let's look at the directions. Find the real zeros, then tell their multiplicity, then decide whether the graph touches or crosses. So for each one, we're going to identify the real zero. Remember, the x in the front is always going to give me an answer of zero. This one has a multiplicity of, look at your exponent, three. And since three is odd, so three is odd, it's going to cross. So we don't look at the whether zero is even or odd, we look at whether the multiplicity is even or odd. So since three is odd, it crosses. Same thing with the next one. Negative one. The only exponent I see, I don't, so it's a multiplicity of one. And one is odd, so it's going to cross. Here, I end up with positive one, multiplicity one, and that's going to cross as well. Any x squares, I have to make sure I write it out. So I'm going to do x squared plus 4 equals 0. Subtract 4 from both sides and square root. I cannot square root a negative and get a real number, a real 0. So I get nothing from that. Try example number 20. I'll give you just a moment. You should have 3 multiplicity of 1 cross and negative 5 multiplicity of 2 touch.